Welcome to the Dead Celebrities Podcast. In this podcast, we break down high-profile celebrity estate planning cases for advisors and their clients. Most celebrity estate catastrophes are based on the same issues that everyday people face, just with the volume turned up. Our goal is to identify and extract the individual estate planning issues that lie at the heart of each story. We then discuss what advisors should expect and how to avoid common pitfalls. Hosted by WealthManagement.com Senior Editor David Lenick. Today's episode is brought to you by Nationwide Advisory. At Nationwide Advisory Solutions, our mission is to help RAAs and fee-based advisors build their practices by enabling their clients to accumulate more wealth and reach their financial goals. We do this by developing and delivering value-added investment solutions and services that fit the fiduciary standard wrapped in an industry-leading customer experience. To learn more, visit www.nationwideadvisory.com. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the second installment of WealthManagement.com's Celebrity Estate Planning Podcast. For anyone new to the podcast, uh, in each installment, myself and a guest take on a different celebrity estate and attempt to extract some key lessons that planners can apply to their more traditional clients. The idea being that celebrity estate planning catastrophes, and I'm doing air quotes here, even though you can't see me, it's very good radio, uh, although often ridiculous in their details, they generally have at their core very basic issues that can just as easily apply to a non-famous or fabulously wealthy clients. Uh, my name is David Lenick, and I'm a senior editor at WealthManagement.com, and I'm joined uh, for this episode by uh, Avi Z. Kastenbau. Avi is a partner in the tax and tax-exempt organizations departments and co-chair of the Trust and Estates Department at Meltzer, Lip, Goldstein, and Brightstone in New York. Uh, he's also a member of the Trust and Estate Magazine Editorial Advisory Committee. Uh, he provides creative and sophisticated domestic and international tax, estate planning, and asset preservation counsel to CEOs of major corporations, ultra-high net worth individuals, multinational businesses, and large charitable organizations. Thanks for joining us, Avi. Thank you, David. In the last episode, we tackled the, uh, the patently ridiculous uh, Casey Kasem story. This time, we're going to focus on an example that's a bit more solemn, uh, Robin Williams. Uh, for those who somehow haven't heard of him, uh, Robin, since there's a bunch of people named Williams in this story, we're just going to be on a first name basis with so basically everyone from here on out, was a beloved comedian and Oscar winning actor with a career that spanned over 40 years before he tragically took his own life in August of 2014. Uh, in a weird bit of trivia, an autopsy revealed that Williams was suffering from Lewy body dementia, which was the very same condition that silenced Casey Kasem. Williams was married three times, the first of which First of which, two of which produced a total of three children, Zach from his first marriage and Zelda and Cody from his second. At the time of his death, he was married to his third wife, Susan Schneider. The couple had no biological children together. Uh, in what I think may be a fairly unique case in this series of podcasts, Williams' estate was well-crafted and actually fairly ingenious in its structure in a number of ways, uh, particularly given his sudden death. So instead of talking about what we can learn from how he screwed up, um, Avi and I are going to try to focus on uh, what positive advisors can take away from his plan, as well as the fact that, you know, sadly, no matter how comprehensive a plan is, some conflicts uh, seem simply inevitable. So we'll start with the conflict. Uh, six months after Robin's death, his children, Zach, 31, Zelda, 25, and Cody, 23, from his previous two marriages, entered into a bitter estate battle with his widow, Susan Schneider Williams, uh, his third wife. Now, interestingly, this battle had nothing to do with the 50-some-odd million that uh, Robin left in his estate, because he covered that fairly thoroughly in a series of trusts. One trust, called the Dominus Duchess Domus Holding Trust, which means home sweet home, uh, contained his real estate properties. Another was created for his three children and was to pay out, whether he was alive or dead, when they reached ages of 21, 25, and 30. Um, a few years before his death, Williams amended the second trust, originally set up for his three children, to include some provisions for his now wife, Susan. According to the updated trust, she would be provided her own separate trust called the Susan Trust, which contained the home they lived in and the contents within, subject to certain restrictions. She was also to be provided with enough finances, liquid or otherwise, to cover all costs related to the residence for the duration of her lifetime. Now, it appears, for all intents and purposes, that this part of Robin's plan had everything pretty well squared away, um, but you should never underestimate the ability of a grieving family to find something to fight over. Uh, the amended trust states that all clothing, jewelry, and personal photos taken prior to his marriage to Susan as well as his memorabilia and awards in the entertainment industry, and any items he kept at his home in Napa County, California, were to go to his children. Now, in December and January, court documents revealed a battle between Williams' widow and his children that sort of centered not on big-ticket items and cash, but smaller personal effects like clothing, photographs, and collectibles. So Williams' collections, which included bicycles, graphic novels, and other items gathered over the years, were really at the center, and they were highly contested by both parties because of the emotional value attached due to how they reflected his unique, quirky personality. 
Um, the dispute settled in October 2015, and the details weren't made super public. Avi, it seems like you know this was a pretty thorough estate plan that had, it tried to cover most bases, and yet we still had a fight. Um, how does this sort of thing happen? So th- this estate, even with good planning and proper legal advice, was a recipe for disaster. And the reason being is there are children from different marriages and a third wife. And these folks are naturally going to think differently. And they each have a point of view. Their point of view is somewhat rational, but also emotional. And the children, I'm sure, feel, hey, Robin was our dad for our whole lives. And we should get almost everything, including these personal belongings where where there were some issues over them. His wife may feel that she was married to him for just three years, but he loved her. And why shouldn't she be entitled to certain items that have emotional value? Now, even though these items have emotional and sentimental value, let's not forget, they probably have real value as well. Because if Robin Williams sneezed into a tissue, that tissue may have some value. So, (laughs) I, you know, again, I, I'm saying that a little bit funny, but it is true um, that while these items and there was a dispute over the sentimental um, value, if we read between the lines a little bit, uh, these items have real real value as well. But recipe for disaster because of the familial situation, which is not uncommon. And from an estate planner's point of view, these are the most complex situations to deal with. It's impossible to make everyone happy. And both the children and the spouse, in this case, a third spouse, they each have legitimate feelings and no one is right. No one is wrong. And Robin and his attorneys certainly tried very hard to make things as clear as possible. Among the items that were done very well is there was a prenup, a prenuptial agreement defining what Susan would get upon death or divorce. Though I haven't seen the prenup, there was a prenup, which I'm assuming was well done. Um, There was also a no contest provision that if anyone contested the will, that person wouldn't receive anything, at least if if it was. The trust also, uh, I'm sorry, the the will poured into a trust, almost known as a pour over will, because the assets pour into the trust and the trust really could have avoided public eye and scrutiny because will is of public record, the trust not necessarily. So even that was was very well thought out. But really the familial situation made things very, very complicated. So for an advisor with sort of more typical clients, this is not, in a weird way, this is kind of not the most hopeful story, right? I mean, they they did did most things right, and yet this still happened. Is there anything that they left out that that maybe could have helped prevent uh, this sort of thing from happening? So what I would say is it was still a success because the estate was settled. Mm -hmm. And while there were legal proceedings and I'm sure a lot of time, money and aggravation wasted, there was a settlement. And it's not like this case dragged on for many years. If the attorneys didn't do such a fine job, uh, the situation would have been so much worse. So, again, still worked out okay. Really, the only comments that I have that might have been done differently, but it's very easy to uh, play Monday morning quarterback, is perhaps the personal belongings. There could have been greater specificity in the trust, uh, greater definitions, examples, uh, things of that nature. Um, Also, for the upkeep of the home, there was mention about a reserve fund. The truth is that's really good language because it's got to be up to the trustees to figure out how much is needed. I guess Robin could have specified no reserve fund where the trustees have to figure out how much may be needed, but just the house and a million dollars, a house that she can live in, I'm sorry, and a million dollars and let that million dollars take care of whatever she wants, including the upkeep meaning to have a finite amount instead of, hey, the trustees will set up a reserve funds and take care of expenses. But I might have done it the same way as the attorneys, easy to second guess, but perhaps a finite amount is always better than leaving any discretion. That applies both to the upkeep of the house, a finite amount, and also 
related to these these personal and emotional belongings. But again, very difficult to capture all personal belongings. Obviously, everyone has a lot of sentimental items and certainly a a celebrity. Obviously, as, as many of us know, his actual publicity rights, meaning not the personal items, but his likeness, his image, that went uh, to a, a charitable organization and was is, is actually restricted for 25 years after death that cannot be used at all. And after 25 years, proceeds go to a charitable organization. So that's an interesting fact that there was not a lot of focus on because that had nothing to do with his children or his wife because neither of them uh, are getting uh, money or, or the rights to those assets. Mm -hmm. And this is really sort of the ingenious part of his estate, right? I mean, we mentioned that there were the two parts. There was a conflict and then this part where sort of an example of like, hey, this is a really cool way to do this. You know, so on this sort of positive note, just to reiterate what you just said, you know, he really dealt with intangible property very well in his estate. And this is maybe a useful model for high-profile clients who need to consider these sort of issues. He, you know, via trust bequeathed uh, his rights to his name, signature, photograph, and likeness to the Windfall Foundation, which is just a charity he set up by his legal, his own legal reps. There's basically two important parts of this to know. Like first, you know, the trust restricts exploitation of his right of publicity for 25 years, as you mentioned. So there's not going to be any unauthorized advertisements or holograms or film appearances or any other sort of cockamamie way they come up with of uh, sort of bringing back dead celebrity likeness uh, until August 11th, 2039. And um, the second is that even if the Windfall Foundation is somehow deemed ineligible for a charitable deduction by the IRS, the trust uh, accounts for that. It mandates that his uh, publicity rights be distributed to one or more organizations with a similar purpose, like Doctors Without Borders, Make-A-Wish, you know, sort of, we've heard of these places, which do qualify for a charitable deduction sort of uh, inarguably. And it seems like this is a direct reaction to the, the Michael Jackson fight that was going on uh, about the same time over the same issue where the IRS sort of just decided to, to, to slap Jackson's estate out of the clear blue sky with sort of a $400 million uh, likeness valuation, um, in what is kind of a matter of first impression in a weird way. It seems like assigning these publicity rights to a tax advantage charitable organization uh, could limit you know, Robin's family's tax liability uh, in, in a way that you know, Jackson's estate kind of didn't. Um, so by doing what he did, Robin not only asserted a measure of control over his you know, posthumous exploitation of his image, but he sort of recognized the value of his afterlife has gone up in recent years and made a step to mitigate the IRS's interests. It's actually this uh, amazingly forethinking that he, that he did here, Avi. Yeah, no, it definitely very forward thinking. Um, if we look every year, there are lists published about the highest earning celebrities after death, and the numbers are staggering. From Michael Jackson, who you mentioned, to Elvis Presley, to Marilyn Monroe, to Elizabeth Taylor. I mean, their likeness, their image, their brand, it exists forever. My guess is that most of these celebrities made more money dead than alive mm -hmm. because um, everyone had a, has a finite lifetime. In this case, Robin Williams, 60 years Count up all the money Robin Williams made over 60 years. I'm curious, over the next 60 years or 100 years, will more money be made from his likeness and his image after he died? Now, certainly musicians, that that fact uh, may be true. I don't know about a comedian, but uh, certainly it, it's possible. And yes, the uh, giving this to a charitable organization certainly prevents an IRS dispute, uh, fight over taxes. Though on the other hand, it also means that Robin's children nor his wife will receive any proceeds. And obviously the numbers could be in the tens of millions of dollars. I have not seen the charitable organization documents, but I'm also curious, what's the charity for? Who benefits uh, who's making the decisions on giving out the money. I mean, we could be talking about many millions of dollars, but it is true. It is a way to prevent uh, estate taxes um, and also to do good and stop fights over uh, likeness and images, which happen all the time. There is a lesson even for those of us who may not have much value after we die for our likeness and image, and that is we have other parts of us that may be valuable, our medical information, perhaps things we, we, we've written, and even sentimental value uh, for these items. Uh, it is a whole uh, new area of law involving Facebook accounts and, and, and all uh, social and social media, what happens. So the lesson is still there that there could be disputes over this. And really, this information may have both sentimental value and even 
perhaps monetary value, which, which, which could apply to, to medical history. Interesting. So you know, for the more typical client, certainly not celebrity, who's worried about is more either sentimental or um, I guess not likeness rights related things. What can they kind of take away from this? What can, you know, if I'm an advisor, maybe not even an attorney, but I notice that my client maybe has the potential to make some money after death. What are, what are some of the techniques that I can maybe, you know, look to use to try to, to, to preserve it? So the first thing is to think. Um, I think that today everyone thinks they can do it themselves, uh, whether it's a do-it-yourself estate planning programs, uh, going to the a local attorney who may specialize in 10 different areas. But, but this stuff is complex. And we're also dealing with items that the law really hasn't thought about, um, changes in technology, changes in the way we act, changes in the value of items. So a lot of this is brand new. So the first thing is to think and to realize this needs to be done well and it needs to be done correctly and to really get good advice. After that, you know, items, again, may include leaving these types of assets to a trust, naming trustees, you know, similar to uh, Robin, but perhaps not a charitable trust, but just people who our friends and clients feel will do the right thing with these images, the likeness, medical information, passwords. A lot of this is about trust. And again, complicated, but we've got to find the people that we think will do the right thing. We cannot predict everything, certainly with the rapid changes in technology. We, we don't know what the future will be, but it's really putting the decisions in the hands of uh, men and women who we think will act rationally and similar to uh, how we would have acted. Right, so as we're getting ready to sort of wrap up here, I like to try to put a, a neat little bow on things that maybe uh, don't necessarily lend themselves to that treatment. I think one of the things you said in our conversation that, that was very important to take away here is the idea that a, a state plan doesn't necessarily need to completely avoid litigation and completely avoid conflict in order to be considered successful. Um, and I think that's an important uh, thing to point out that even I sometimes forget that sometimes it's just impossible and just the estate plan can do be sort of set up to do the best job it can do in the circumstances that it, it faces. Yeah. No, I, David, very true. I often tell my clients and I use my hands and I stretch out my right arm all the way and I say, you have families on this side. It doesn't matter how messed up the documents are. They won't fight and they will work it out. And then I take my left arm and I stretch it all the way out. And then I say, I have families on this side who it doesn't matter how well thought out how well drafted, how much time and effort was put in, they will fight no matter what. And there's only so much we can do because everyone is entitled to his or her day in court. And then you have everyone in the middle of these uh, two, two arms. And it really makes a significant difference how the documents were drafted and also the thought that was put in to mitigate the dispute, to make it less like the Robin Williams example. It was less because of the time and effort that was put in um, by the professionals and I'm sure by Robin himself. So uh, yes, this is not a lesson in a celebrity failure. I think this was a success because the damage was limited um, with proper thought and proper planning. And just to be clear, documents can only do so much. A lot of it is getting the players involved to be rational, be calm, which takes place before death. Once de death happens, the gloves come off. But it's really very important today to uh, make sure that everyone is aware of the expectations and um, thought has to go into this. It's very interesting. Sort of in a way, you could say that you know, the point of estate planning is to sort of create rationality and order in, in a time when it's really sort of completely antithetical. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's exactly it. Once death happens, the emotions, deep psychological feelings, resentments, uh, wives who may not be the mother of the children, it just it becomes a mess. And the key is keep it orderly. So those messes could happen, but the expectations are set. Everyone is kind of aware of what's going to happen and proper legal documents to, to deal with these issues. Well, this was really fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Avi. Thank you, David. Really uh, my pleasure. And to all our listeners, uh, hopefully you enjoyed the podcast, and uh, hopefully we'll see you next time. 
Thank you for listening to the Dead Celebrity Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to become notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guest and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of InformaWealthManagement.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only. The content is not intended to be a substitute for professional investing advice. Always seek the advice of your financial advisor or other qualified financial service provider with any questions you may have regarding your investment planning. 